Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Well, I knew this girl was going to be a perfect fit for my audience when I saw what the name of her podcast was. She's the host of the podcast, Breaking Up with Yo-Yo Dieting. Amber McKenzie is an author, speaker, and former yo-yo dieter who now lives in a body she loves. She helps women build healthy relationships with their bodies, and food now excites her. Welcome, Amber McKenzie. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here chatting with you today. Yay. I know. I, was, I almost just kept reading there, which was like, I have all my notes here, so I, <laughs> I was going to just keep on going. And then I was like, wait a sec. Those are, those are my questions for you. <laughs> which the first one being, Amber, like you come from this world of yo-yo dieting that so many women do, including myself. Yeah. And I would love to hear about what life was like as the yo-yo dieter before you had your aha moment of let's break up with this yo-yo dieting bowl oh. crap. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good question. What was it like before? And there's yeah. so many things I could say, but I think the first thing was like tired. I was so tired, tired of looking at the scale and determining what I should eat that day. I was tired of being hungry and walking around like a zombie. I was tired of feeling like there was something broken in me that I didn't have any willpower when I saw like a bread, just a piece of bread, that's it. Or like a cookie or chocolate chip, you know, like I felt like there was this uncontrollable little food monster in me that I couldn't get rid of. And I was just tired of feeling that way. I was tired of the sugar highs and the sugar crashes. I was tired of my clothes not fitting. I was tired of the high of then having my clothes fit. And then, you know, a couple of days later when they wouldn't go on. And I think the best way to sum that up is I just felt like, you know, I got to this place where I was like, I don't care. I was at one of my heaviest weights. I remember thinking, I don't care if I have to be this heavy forever. If I can stop this insanity wow. of the being hungry and the being super full and the clothes fitting and the clothes not fitting and the scale, like I was so tired, but like just defeated too. Like, you know, like seeing other people that live in these amazing bodies and thinking that's just not for me. And it was really disappointing because in so many other realms of my life, I'm a high achiever. Like I was on the national team for Taekwondo in Canada. Um, I have a master's degree. So I was able to go out and do all of these amazing things. But the one thing I couldn't seem to figure out was my body. So that was super frustrating. And I was just so tired. So that's really, it sums up like what it was like, just exhausted. And did, were you like that, like throughout your teens too? Like when did it start? I always like to know when it started for somebody. You know, this is a really good question that I've really thought about. And you know, I don't think it quite started at this age, but I have this memory of watching a commercial and it was a little boy. I really remember it so vividly because I was about six and he's looking in the mirror and he's grabbing like his tummy roll and he's saying, "Uh Oh, this isn't good. And I remember going upstairs to my mom and grabbing my tummy and saying, mommy, this isn't good. And just Aww. mimicking his behavior. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I have this as a memory. And then she grabbed her tummy and said, no, no, you don't have like, no, you don't have anything. I have this. I don't think it really started then, but I do have that as some visit, vivid memory that must have planted some seed because I don't remember a lot else from when I was six, but I remember that very vividly. But what I do know what happened is my family went through a lot of chaos. And so um, my brother, when I was, when he, he's younger than me, but growing up in, in my teens. So by the time he was 12, he was a full blown alcoholic and drug addict. And so, I mean, I grew up in a reasonable middle-class home with lovely working middle-class parents. There's no reason, you know, we had food on our tables, roofs over our head, went to schools. So there was no like good reason that necessarily my brother should have been so addicted. Um, but that was what happened in my life and in my family. And, but I was too young to understand, like, although I was a teenager, I conceptually understood, but I also didn't get it. And I think one of the things that happened to me was I had to make sense of like why my parents were always so involved with my brother. I had to make sense of why I didn't feel like I got attention and I had to make sense of what was happening to my brother. And in some skewed, distorted way in my head, I thought it was my fault. My brother was an alcoholic. If I could only be a better sister, then he would be fine. And then I had to create some reason why I didn't get attention. And so the reason that my young Amber mind developed was because it was I, I wasn't skinny enough and I wasn't pretty enough. 
So therefore my family didn't love me. And you know, that just so wasn't true, but that was the story I made up. And then I also thought, okay, if my family doesn't love me, then the way that I can find love is to be skinny and pretty and I will find love. So that really started my quest in high school to start dieting. I remember there's these gyms called Curves for Women. I don't even know if they still exist. Yes, I remember the Curves for Women. <laughs> yeah, and you'd like go and run on the spot and do a couple weights. You'd go for half an hour and my girlfriend started bringing me with her mom and I would go to that and then I would go to volleyball practice and I started really focusing on trying to lose weight, but I didn't have any clue about the eating piece. But I remember being really determined that I wanted to be skinny and I wanted to be pretty because then I thought someone would love me. And mm -hmm. that I remember just so clearly. And I think that really snowballed over time. Mm -hmm. I think, and I, you know, tell me your opinion on this. I would say that majority of women probably feel the same way, which is why that they're, why they're determined to lose weight and exercise is this like idea that if I'm pretty, if I look good, then I can be loved and I'm worth, yeah. I'm worthy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, it's really funny because the two main like loves of my life, like soul crushing loves, like I'm so lucky. I feel like I've had two. And the first one that I like had this soul crushing love, like this deeply passionate, intimate love. And we lived together for two years. I met him at my heaviest weight and he just loved me and I loved him just so fiercely and it didn't work out. And then my current um, fiance, we, um, we met, I was skinny and I was dieting like eight CG only eating cauliflower. Like it was so miserable and crazy. Um, but I thought that one of the only reasons he wanted to be with me because I was skinny and pretty. So we met when I was thin. So then I was determined to like stay really thin, but I had, I was going to these extreme measures and hardly eating. And I would fluctuate between the hardly eating and then this insane binge eating that I couldn't seem to stop. And um, then I had to get really get into recovery. And I started working with this dietitian at the time. And I gained, I had to gain like 30 pounds because I was underweight. And my food was all dysregulated. It was like, I would eat a food that basically wasn't a vegetable. And I would just put on weight because I was so like weirdly wow. malnourished. I mean, I was eating, but just the way my body started responding. And I was so freaked out that he was going to leave me because I was gaining weight. And one of the most beautiful blessings as I gained some of the weight was he loved me just the same. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I got to see myself through his eyes, which was, it didn't actually matter if I had 30 more pounds on my body. He still loved me for me. And it was almost like I had this smack in the face of like, oh my God, why am I trying to like do these, my poor body, I am lovable just enough. And it was really through him, I was able to start seeing who I truly was. And then it hit me that both times I've had like a soul crushing deep love. It had nothing to do with how I looked. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And so what transition, what, what made you decide? Was it that? Was it him? Was it the dietitian that got you to say and believe like, Hey, I got to, I have to shift this. This is wrong. I have to break up with yo-yo dieting. <laughs> you know what it was is I had, um, <sighs> I just done some binge eating and we had been talking about moving in together. And I'm like sitting on my bathroom floor after this binge and I'm thinking, oh crap. Like I cannot move in with someone that I adore and be doing this insane stuff. Like I don't want him to see me with 12 cookies and a bag of something and then like hiding it. And like, I used to also like, there was something like a hoarding behavior that came over me too. Like I'd be like sneaking it. Like I lived like as an adult alone, but I'd still be sneaking my food, like as if someone was going to take it away. And I was like, what is like, you cannot move in with someone you adore and be wanting to start your life like this. Like, that's crazy. I started thinking like, what if I want to have a family with this man? Do I want, do I want my poor kids to be seeing this? And it really hit me like a ton of bricks. Like I'd heard people think like, say things like, Oh, what's your why and have kids. And you can't demonstrate this to your kids, but it never hit me the same way until I looked at him and thought, Oh my God, like I cannot be this human. And then it just hit me. And I thought, okay, now it's time to, to make a change. And it definitely wasn't an overnight process by any stretch of the imagination, but that was really the starting place. And then it evolved to like gaining some weight and working with her and then getting up to a weight I wasn't comfortable with and reworking it. And so it's been a, a couple years of evolution, but a lot of really important lessons happened. 
Yes. And so I would love to hear some of the tools that you use that helped you to stop the obsession with dieting. Because yeah. I know we, I mean, I was there, there's so many women there. I still get asked on a daily basis, like, you know, why, you know, we have to calorie count and I have to, uh, how, how many carbs do I need to be eating and yeah, yeah. what should I do for exercise? And I mean, majority of women are still extremely focused on the numbers, on the fanatical starvation diets. Right. So how does a person go about breaking up with the yo-yo dieting? Yeah. I mean, the first thing to like really get real with yourself about that I had to get really real with myself about is ask, is this working? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Is it, is it working? Like, yes, I am starving myself. Am I happy? No, I'm a miserable, crazy gremlin. I'm either hangry, raging at somebody or I'm a cookie monster trying to eat everything in the closet. No, no. The Seven Eleven was my hit, but you know, I was, it wasn't working. I was counting. I was starving. I was like, and I was miserable and I kept gaining weight. Yeah. Yeah. Is it working is the first question. Like, is it working? Yeah, I know. Everyone listen to Amber. Is it working? No. Or you probably wouldn't be listening to this podcast. right? Right. Like I talked to a woman yesterday. It was a direction call, like a discovery call. So yeah. She was telling me, like, very proud of herself. Well, when I was on a really strict diet and I was measuring my food, I was only eating three meals a day and I had exact calories, I lost the weight and I kept it off. I mean, then I gained it again, but I lost it again doing the same thing. So I know I can do it. And I'm like, but did it work? And she's like, no, I guess it didn't. And I'm like, so you you can't, don't do that again. Don't think that being that restrictive works because it doesn't. It never works. Always fails. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think that's the thing, right? Is, you know, on a very basic level, calories in versus calories out. If you restrict calories, you will lose weight. I mean, right. In the short term, but then what happens? So if we look at the key starvation studies, so, you know, this is really interesting research done after world war II, where they put all of these men on a calorie restricted diet. And, you know, by calorie restricted, they're still eating like 1800 ish calories. They're not, it's not even like, you know, it's not an HCG diet or eating 500 or Bernstein or eating 500 calories a day. Like these men are still eating and they started engaging in really interesting food behavior. So during the course of the study, some of these men started hoarding food, binge eating food, like at the grocery store and just doing weird things where some of the men even had to drop out of the study because they started doing weird things with food. Of course they lost weight eventually their body stopped losing because you can only lose so much, but you know, and then what actually happened on the other side. So there was some men in the calorie restricted phase that didn't have any weird food behaviors, but then once the restriction phase ended and they started to slowly reintegrate calories back in, then they started doing weird food behaviors. So we're talking hoarding, we're talking binge eating, we're talking eating till you feel sick, right? And this study overwhelmingly showed that whether it's in the restriction phase or when we're done the restriction phase, many people who reduce too much then go on to like be unable to control themselves with food. And so we get so caught up in thinking like, it's me, I have no willpower or I am broken or I am defective. It's something about me. But we forget like, if you are listening to this podcast, it's highly probable you're a human and I certainly am. (laughs) And as humans, we have this really interesting thing that happens in our head. So we can tell ourselves, I am not going to eat today. And that sounds like Amber in my head when I say that, right? Just like I can say, I'm going to climb five flights of stairs and I'm going to keep my breathing even. Okay. I can say that in my head, but as I start to climb the stairs, my heart rate starts going and eventually I need to breathe heavier. And in my head, I make this deal with myself that goes, okay, fine. Now you can breathe deeper. You can breathe faster. But it sounds like my own voice in my head. It's not my voice though. It's my biology saying like, girl, you're climbing stairs and you have to breathe to get the right oxygen to your bloodstream so your muscles can work, so your heart can beat. It's not actually amber. It is, you know, my biology going off. And I love that because I think it's the same thing that happens when we're on a calorie reduced diet. And then after we, we hear our own voice in our head saying like, eat the cookie, yeah. eat, the, eat all the bread. And it sounds like us, but it's, it's, you know, it's our biology. We just deprived ourselves so much and your body doesn't know that 
you know, there's a grocery store around the corner and that your, your cupboard is full of food. It thinks you're in the desert and you're starving and there's a mirage and the mirage has food and like, maybe it's real and it's excited and it just wants you to eat all the things. Right. And so when I started to understand how deprivation really worked, so that's both physical deprivation. If Amber doesn't feed her body, suddenly she's hoarding food in the inner like food monster and her own voice has come out and it wants all the food. So that's the physical side. But then there's the emotional deprivation side. If I say, Amber, you can never have cookies, cake, candy, bacon, never. Well, then I get emotional deprivation. And we say food is fuel. That's true. Food is also this beautiful, pleasurable, amazing experience that truly lights up the dopamine, give, you know, lights up the pleasure center in our brain. And when Amber says to Amber, no, you can't have the goods, my brain is like in this weird little starvation. And so when I also deprive, not just physically, but emotionally, then I want the things I can't have. So what I really had to work my way come to is it didn't work to deprive. Yes, it yes. worked in a short time. When, when I deprived, I did lose weight. But just like in the Keys study, those men lost weight and then they started doing weird things with food. I was just like the Keys study. I lost weight and then I did weird things with food and then I gained weight back. And depending on how restrictive I was, then determined how long I did weird things with food, just like the study. Okay. And so... I had to learn that when I am moderate, when I reasonably indulge, when I reasonably eat within a a normal-esque caloric range, my insane food behavior stops. Yes, I don't drop 10 pounds overnight. Yes, I, you know, I'm not going to shed 50 pounds before the summer wedding coming up. But what I can do is manage my weight have confidence that if I eat a cupcake tomorrow, today, I'm still going to fit into my clothes tomorrow. And no, if my partner, God forbid, leaves a bag of Sour Patch Kids on the counter, my inner gremlin is not going to come over and eat all of them. They're still going to be there for him. And that is the beauty of learning to eat in a reasonable way. Now, you know, from time to time, you know, I'm an interesting eater. I truly had lost so much touch with reality that I did have to learn how to eat a little bit. So sometimes I talk about light structure as a useful strategy. So sometimes I weigh and measure my food. Sometimes I do track my calories, not all the time, but to get a sense of what is a normal range, because I was so far away from what on earth normal is. Yes. I always say you can use it as a tool. It's a great tool. If you're not sure why you're not losing weight or you're not exactly sure what kind of caloric range you should be in, like, sure, throw it into the calculator, get an estimate. Yeah. It was just an estimate of what maybe your caloric intake should be, Yeah, you know, and your carb intake, whatever it is. Like it's a great tool to use sometimes, but it's not an exact science. And that study that you were talking about, that's so funny. I just read about that study and I just did a podcast episode of a kind of around that study about, yeah. I don't actually talk about the study, but that's where the information came from. Yeah. And it's because your, the hormone ghrelin goes up, which is your hunger hormone. Yeah. So when you starve yourself, ghrelin goes up. So you actually become more hungry than you would had you not been starving yourself. Like it's, it's crazy what happens to our bodies, but we all do it. Don't we ever, because it gives us quick results and normal weight loss, healthy weight loss is a half pound to a pound a week for women. Like that's painfully slow when you have a lot to lose. Right. Yeah. So I can like, I get why women obsess about it and we want to do these quick fix diets, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. No, it, it doesn't. doesn't work. It's so funny you did a podcast on that. I recently did one on that one too. It's called <laughs> a dieting and food obsessed understanding restriction because like, you know, we think restrict, restrict, restrict. I mean, if you ask a five-year-old and you say, how do you lose weight? A five-year-old's going to know, don't eat as much. But, you know, we're misguided in how much restriction we probably need. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. It's and they had a word for it. I don't know if you remember, but there was like it was called like food fanat, like not food, like how they obsessed about the food afterwards. They had a word for it, and I can't remember it. I have to go oh, back and look at know. the study. It was like food 
something or other. It was something about how they actually termed it like they would get crazy yeah. about food. And I've, I felt that way before. I don't know about you, but I oh, yeah. felt that coming out of one of those calorie restricted diets where it was like, I obsessed. And I talk about in the podcast, I went out and bought an ice cream maker because I was determined when I was done the diet, I was going to start making a healthier version of ice cream for myself. Yeah. So I could start eating ice cream again. I yeah. used it for about a week post diet. It's in my garage. I've had it for about seven years. <laughs> <laughs> never used it again but like it makes perfect sense when you're in that deprivation stage you're yes. like i'm gonna do these things i'm gonna do them in moderation it's gonna be kind of, but like yeah you're you're and it's it's your it's so funny because it's your brain in your own voice but it's like not you you know it's coming off with these really interesting stories and it's like yeah you, know, you kind of stabilize after and you're like that was interesting. That was interesting. What just happened to me? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> now for those that are listening, cause there's going to be women out there and I work with a lot of women that would say, you know, moderation. Yeah, that sounds great, but I don't have that kind of control. And it yeah. usually stems from emotion. So can you kind of talk about how the emotion, how, how, why we need to get our emotions in check to be mm. able to control that and to have that happy medium of moderation. Yeah. I mean, that's such a good question. And I think a big thing to remember is lots of us eat for emotion yes. and that's like, okay, sometimes like there's comfort foods. We call them comfort foods for a reason. And comfort foods are sometimes foods, not all the times foods. And, um, you know, in the, in the spirit of, we just talked about tracking and when's that a good thing to do? And when's that not a helpful thing to do. When tracking is not a helpful thing is when you're overly obsessed. So there's times there's people that should never track. There's times when tracking is useful and for emotions is a time when tracking is useful. So, you know, this might not be in my fitness pal tracking your calories. This could be paper and pencil on a paper, just writing down the times you're eating and how you feel in your body. Are you eating in response to hunger? Are you eating in response to it's three o'clock PM, so you think you should eat? Are you eating in response to, oh my gosh, I was just walking in the mall and I smelt Cinnabon and the next thing I knew, I was like licking that cream cheese frosting from the cup? <laughs> Are you eating because you're watching TV and you're bored and a bag of chips just fell into your lap and then it was gone and you don't know what happened? See, tracking is a super useful tool in, in terms of gaining insight into what time was it? how are you feeling and what did you eat? And so we can start to see the relationship between when I am bored, I use eating as an activity. So when I am bored, I eat a cookie because that lights up the pleasure center in my brain. So if boredom is my problem, I can solve boredom by tolerating boredom. So just sit there being bored. I can call a friend. I can go for a walk. I can play with my dog. I can play Candy Crush on my phone. I can scroll on Instagram. There's, there's so many things I can do in response to boredom, but I first have to identify that boredom is my problem. Equally, say I'm eating every day and I'm super anxious. Okay, that's, that's another problem I can solve. So I can say, wow, I'm really anxious. So maybe, you know, that is I call a friend. Maybe that's I learn some mindfulness. Maybe that's I see a psychologist. But I can learn to deal with my anxiety. Maybe I'm starting to notice I'm eating in response to hunger cues. That's amazing. So then we can really tailor and figure out what are the best foods for your body. If you're, you know, you keep falling into the Cinnabon trap where you're like, your nose is smelling things on the way home from work, you're eating hot dogs. We can say, wow, you you know, you're having that, that nose hunger that just comes over you. Um, but the first thing, you know, in dealing with the emotions is to be able to identify them. Once you identify the emotion, you have so many choices. So, you know, I have someone that says Kleenex, not cookies, because she knows that she eats over her sad emotions. She just doesn't want them. And, you know, food works really well when we have feelings because food, I mean, I bet you, most of you listening to this, you're not going for like, you know, a nice balanced meal, maybe a potato and a vegetable and some chicken when, you know, you're emotionally eating. You're going for like the stuff that's lighting up your brain. You know, you're going for the cakes, the breads, the cookies, the candy, maybe the chips, right? Something that is flowery and sugary in its base. And why we go for those is because the properties in those really light up our brain and our brain, you know, it really responds well to those. And they basically eradicate 
the negative emotion you were just having. So it's like most of us, if we have a negative emotion, it passes over time or we find some adaptive coping strategy. Food starts out as an adaptive coping strategy. It works. And then we learn, ooh, that worked. So can I do more of that? Well, hey, like if one was good, hey, 15 will make it better. But then you can't stop. And then, and then there's a rule that probably pops into your head. And the rule probably goes something like, I've blown it. If I've blown it, I'm going to start again tomorrow. So I better make tonight count. Yeah. So we have to be aware of these little like sneaky rules that are in our heads. And we have to adjust the rules too. So my new rule goes something like, because sometimes I emotionally eat. I'm not immune to that, but I have a new rule. So if I'm emotional, so very often I'm tired. Tired for Amber is one of the reasons if I'm going to eat something that isn't in alignment with how I want to feel or how I want to eat, 90% of the time I'm tired, it's nighttime, and that something has ended up in my mouth. So in, I used to go, Amber, you've blown it. You're the worst. You have no willpower and you screwed up. So now you have to eat all the things and start again tomorrow. So you hear my rule. You screwed up. You have to start again tomorrow. So I had to create a new rule. The new rule was, oh, well, sometimes eating chocolate at night is no big deal. And I have the choice to stop right now because the chocolate will be there again tomorrow. If I want the chocolate tomorrow, I can have more tomorrow. If I don't want the chocolate tomorrow, I don't have to have any more tomorrow, but one chocolate won't hurt me. 50 chocolates will likely do some damage on the scale, you know? And so I had to start to realize that when I make mistakes, largely in the grand scheme of things, they're actually not hurting my weight loss if that's my goal. What hurts my weight loss is when I go, today I screwed up. So now not only did I have one chocolate, I'm going to top off that one chocolate with some McDonald's and a McFlurry and a whole cake on top of that. And then I'll start. That hurts my weight loss, right? So I had to really recognize that sometimes mistakes, they just aren't a big deal. So there's a rule in there that had to be adjusted. So there's the emotional eating. Okay, that happens sometimes. Catching it, doing something different. And if you accidentally make a mistake or do something you didn't mean to do, just, oops, that was a mistake oh, well, normal humans make mistakes sometimes. People that live in reasonable sized bodies that love how they look, oops, they eat things they didn't mean to sometimes. It doesn't mean anything about them. Heck, maybe they enjoyed it. So sometimes now if I notice I'm like mid eating a chocolate, I have this thought like, are you going to eat that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm committed now. And I go, well then enjoy every last morsel of that chocolate that you have now committed to. But you know, I think it's just being so aware and then don't be victim to your emotions. So for example, for me, I've talked about my biggest vulnerability is being tired okay. and I work nights. And so I work nights and I am tired and we get junk food brought into our office. So if I'm not careful, it all ends up in my mouth. So this means I have to make a tired plan. So I legit sit down and make a tired plan. And so sometimes that plan means I can have four chocolates in the night because four chocolates isn't going to hurt me. Four chocolates, I mean, they're just little, they're little guys. I'm not talking like big bars. I'm talking like little, little squares. So if I have four chocolates at the end of the night, like four chocolates is not going to hurt me. Four chocolates is going to be delicious and lovely and I'm going to enjoy them. But I also like what I really want when I'm tired, I want a nutritious meal that's actually going to make me full. And I want to be soothed more than anything else. I just want to feel like a warm cup of something and like emotionally okay. And no amount of eating, okay, yeah, it gives me the temporary of that. And so because I know that's really what I'm looking for in my office, I have like a drawer full of drinks that can be warm. So I have like cacaos, I have, um, you know, an adaptogen drink. I have like just hot chocolate. I have so many options. And then making sure I bring a legit night snack that is going to make me full so that I am not actually deprived and I have the options. Oh, and I have a blanket too. So very often at the end of the night, I'll wrap myself in the blanket, still at work. Okay. I'm at work in my office, door closed, wrap myself in the blanket, have my warm like tea drink or whatever I've decided on that day that I want. Cause it has to be something when I'm tired that I actually want. See, emotional deprivation doesn't work. It has yeah. to be something you want still. So it might be hot chocolate, but that's the choice I want and it's reasonable sometimes. 
but it's knowing the emotion is tired. What I want is like comfort and fulfillment and soothing. So I wrap myself, I have my drink and I'm like, I'm okay. I don't like how I feel right now, but that's okay. And I just have to learn to sit with that discomfort and the the icky emotions and the overwhelm and know that my warm drink isn't going to eradicate that. The blanket around my shoulders isn't going to eradicate that, but that's okay because I can handle being tired and overwhelmed and a little frustrated. I can handle a little food craving that, you know, I don't really want. That's okay. It's not going to hurt me. And I had to really learn to coach myself through those feelings. Like you just, how, how you heard me talk in that like little kid voice, like that's okay. That's not going to hurt you. You know, being, being a little tired, a little uncomfortable, that's okay. And I had to learn to adopt that kind of a voice for myself because one of the things I had growing up was I didn't like have a, a nice, I had great parents, but I wouldn't say like empathy and talking nice to me was their strongest suit. And so I had to really figure out if I want to live in a body I love, how do I learn to talk to this body like she is somebody she loves? Mm-hmm. And I had to really work on like a softening towards myself. Just like if I make a food oops, I can be like, oh, Amber, that's okay. You made an oops. Some people make oops sometimes. Would you like another oops today? Like as a, like clearly you're craving something. Would you like that or would you like to stop? And it's like I'm this little kid giving myself options. So yeah, that's it. some of the big things I do to deal with emotions is I just try to treat myself really nice and figure out what the emotion is and then problem solve around it. Yeah. Instead of like stuffing it down and looking to the food to be the answer. I think that that's where we go so wrong because it's hard to look at the emotions, right? I know for me, my trigger is stress always. If I'm suddenly craving sugar all the time and it takes me a while before I figure it out every time I'll be like a couple weeks in, I'll be like, well, I'm sure craving sugar for some reason. (laughs) And then I'm like, oh, I think I'm working too much or I'm too stressed out and I know that I need to like chill out, take some time for myself and instantaneously the sugar cravings go away. It's so yeah. funny, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's hard to do, but when you start to get into the habit of it, of being yeah. aware of your emotions, then it becomes automatic with like exactly what she was just saying, like where you're going to start to be really self-aware and be like, oh, this is what's happening right now. And now you may still choose to go ahead and have the chocolate, but at least you're aware of why you're craving the chocolate so Mm -hmm. that maybe next time you can have a different tool in place that will help. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also too like kind of about permission. Some like, yeah, sometimes permission. So sometimes I want to pleasurably enjoy this food because it actually is going to help my emotion. But the delicate balance here is food doesn't solve all emotional problems. And so sometimes is reasonable. All the times will help you gain weight, right? Yeah. So it's that yeah. it's that delicate balance. Yeah, and if it's happening all the time, all of the time, then you know you got to quit looking at the food, you got to go inside and figure out what is driving the behavior. It's not the diet, it's something that's going on inside that you need to start looking at because that's that's the key. Right. You, and you said something really important before. You said something like, Amber, moderation, like people can't do that. And I want to start out just quickly acknowledge that and say, yes, of course, I hear you because people used to talk to me about moderation and intuitive eating. And I was like, no, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I am not a moderation and intuitive. Like, no, just, just no, thank you. I cannot be around sugar. Like get that away from me. Lock the doors. I literally asked my parents to put a lock on the cabinet because I was like crazy around it. But what I had to do also was like learn to eat those foods. So go out and eat a cupcake, make Mm -hmm. a plan, see what happened, do it with a friend and slowly and safely practice eating trigger foods. Yes. So like, okay, so the peanut butter, I couldn't have peanut butter in my house for so long. And today we have peanut butter squares in the fridge. My fiance has his peanut butter on a shelf because he eats, we eat different foods. And then I have my natural peanut butter, my other nut butter in the thing. He just has like this big tub. The, who knows what Skip, or Skippy or something. Something yeah, with lots I of sugar in it. In there with the spoon. Like if it was in the house, it was in me. And what I had to learn to do when I was not craving peanut butter was open the cupboard, take out the peanut butter jar, take the lid off. Because what used to happen to me is I'd be taking the lid off and I'd be like, I'm committed now. You can't put the lid back on. So I had to practice like getting to that point, taking the lid off and then putting the lid back on and putting it away, walking away and like going and having a shower doing something else. So moderation is a skill. So some people, there's those intuitive eaters out there. They just got it. They know moderation intuitively. Like my dog knows, 
how to eat when he's hungry and stop when he's full. So does my fiance. Amber, I think I destroyed that with my restrictive eating. Today, I will say it's back. It is back because I had to learn moderation and intuition as a skill. So doing things like tracking, what is Amber feeling? Is Amber hungry? Why is she eating? I had to learn and I had to learn how to stop after I started. So one of the things that happens to me is if I get eating a piece of bread, I'll use as an example, those like light up my brain and I get all triggered and I think like, now I need the whole loaf. And I had to learn to tolerate that desire for more and stop. So I was still screaming on the inside for more and I had to find something else to do to distract myself from that craving and just keep telling myself there is more bread. I can have it tomorrow. So if you don't do moderation, you don't know how to do it. I want to tell you that is so okay. You're going to make lots of flops and fall on your head and sometimes you're going to eat the whole loaf of bread. I'm not giving you permission to go do it, but I'm saying it's going to happen and that's okay. That's a normal part of overcoming like an addictive process. That's a normal part of fluctuating between the extreme end of some sort of foodie problem to a normal eater that gets to live in a body they're comfortable in. You're going to make lots of mistakes and it's totally going to be messy and that is so okay, but it's that practice, practice, practice equals, you know, better. Yes. Oh, I love it. It's such great. That's like amazing advice. Like I think it's so perfect and it's something that everybody can get something from that, right? Like, cause we all, even me, who's, who is a very intuitive eater, I'm very in tune with my body, but I use a lot of those little tips that you just gave and I'm going to start using more of them now. But like, even the one where it's like, if for me, it's, if I start eating something that's lighting up my brain, A, I, I make sense of what's happening. I go to the science and I'm like, oh, my brain wants more of the cake or whatever it is because it just, you know, threw in some amazing hormones in there. Like just Bang. You know, if they say it's the same, sugar is the same, it lights up the same areas of the brain as cocaine does. Yeah. Brain. Lots of research on right? that. Right? Yeah. So yeah. I'll do that. I'll, I'll think like through the science of it, how it's lighting up different areas of my brain. And this is why it's calling out for more. And I always tell myself, okay, take a break from whatever I'm eating. If I still want it in an hour, I can go back and have some more. Yeah. Because once those chemicals calm down in my brain, I usually don't want it anymore. Right. Almost like hundred yeah. percent of the time I don't want it anymore. It's right. just like stopping though <laughs> is the tough part, right? But if you can get into that habit, then it's okay. And I always tell people too, like try and like if you have something that you're doing, like how Amber was saying at nighttime when she's working and she wants to eat those foods, how she replaced all the stuff that was being brought in with other staff members, how she replaced it with her own pleasure, which was, uh, you know, a cup of hot chocolate or, or tea or whatever it is. Always replace a pleasure with a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Like if you try to get rid of it and you don't replace it with something, it's a matter of time before you're going to go back to it. Right. Cause that's addiction. And we're, we're creatures of pleasure. We don't want to be in pain. No, we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> so just replace it with like dark chocolate, you know, instead of like the really sugary chocolate cookie, Yeah. Eat a couple of squares of dark chocolate because they'll tell you what, that's not going to be, if you could do that every night and it's not going to make you gain weight, it just yeah. doesn't. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, Amber... It's fantastic. I'm going to have to have you on again because we could oh. probably keep talking and I just want to pick your brain about more stuff because I know that you've got a lot of experience with addiction and, and I just, I love that kind of stuff. I love how our brain works and how to, how can we manipulate our own brain to make this easier kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, any parting words for the woman that needs to break up with yo-yo dieting? Yeah, I think It is so scary to be willing to eat more. It is so scary to intentionally try to practice eating trigger foods. It is so scary to eat them and wonder the next day if you gain weight. That is so scary. And it is so brave. But I want you to really check in and go, is this working? Am I happy? Am I free? Am I living in a body I love? And if you're not happy and you're not free and you're not living in a body you love, you know, maybe it's not working and maybe, just maybe, you need a little bit of help to learn 
how to eat, you know, and we're not saying go, I used to hear like, go get fat by eating more balanced. That's what I heard. That's not what we're saying. We're saying eating in a way to serve your body so you can live in a body you love, feel comfortable in, and you can be happy, joyous, and free around food. Yeah. And you can still eat the chocolate, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> which is great sometimes, right? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> find the happy place. Well, yeah. thank you. You can find Amber at Breaking Up With Yo-Yo Dieting. Um, she has an amazing podcast. I think you've got about 90 episodes out, don't you? Like there's quite a few in there. I think I'm at 93 or 94 right? yeah, she's or something like that. she's throwing out two a week, which is great. So yeah. we'll check it out, Breaking Up With Yo-Yo Dieting. And thank you again, Amber, for coming and being a guest on the show. Oh, my pleasure. It was so lovely to chat with you. Thank you so, 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 so much for having me on.